Hi everyone. I hope you're all doing well and in the mood for a mystery today, because I'm here with a review of Alex Michelides' The Silent Patient. This book was published in 2019 and was overwhelmingly positively received, so it's quite likely that you've heard of it before. Many have described the book as a psychological thriller, which I didn't know exactly what that was because I'm not really familiar with the genre, and I'll talk about that soon. But what drew me personally to the book was that after reading a lot of Agatha Christie mysteries and a bit of Dorothy L. Sayers recently, both of which were published in the first half of the 20th century in the sort of golden age of detective fiction as it's often called, I was looking to read a more modern mystery uh, to see how things have changed in the past hundred years. And this book appeared on a few lists as an example of a popular modern mystery novel. Interestingly, uh, I noticed a few characteristics of the investigation that still reminded me of Agatha Christie's stories, which turns out not to have been a coincidence, as I learned after reading this book that the author was uh, himself an avid Christie fan and inspired by her writings for this book. That said, I think it's fair to say that this book, although it has some elements of the whodunit, uh, plays more emphasis on the character development and development of suspense and the overall atmosphere than it does on constructing a foolproof mystery for the readers to solve. Before I go further, I'll just mention that the first half of this review is going to be pretty much spoiler-free, and then I'll tell you when to leave if I piqued your interest and you want to go read the book yourself before watching the rest of the review. I will give a few minor spoilers in the sense that I'll be telling a few things that you'll learn very early on in the first third or so of the book, uh, and would probably also even learn just from reading the jacket of the book. Now, since this book was described as a psychological thriller, which in my mind I kind of associated with psychological horror, which is not really up my alley, I had a few reservations before reading this book and while going into the first few chapters. First of all, will this book be gruesome and terrifying? No, not really at all. Uh, this book is really more of a mystery book than a thriller. It's not even what I'd call super suspenseful in a typical thriller sort of way. It's more psychological, as you kind of expect, in trying to understand why a woman committed an inexplicable act of violence and murdered her husband. Now, yes, it does deal with murder, so if that's already too much, then don't read this book. And when I looked up the term psychological thriller, I found that indeed it does often overlap with the psychological horror genre, so the line isn't necessarily a clean one. And independently of everything else that goes on in the story, it does take place in a psych ward and focuses on psychological experiences of patients and of the narrator, uh, all of which are important to understanding the overall narrative, so it's probably accurately classified as such. Being a book that deals with issues of mental health, I also wondered, is it going to be one where we get an interesting story, but one that feels like it's kind of at the expense of people with real mental health issues? And although I can't really speak to all the mental conditions described in this book and represented, uh, it seemed to me quite a mature discussion and portrayal of mental health conditions. In fact, given that the work and often the failings of mental health specialists are front and center in this book, one might also ask, do we see the mental health profession portrayed too cynically? And I'm fine with some of the psychiatrists not being the best people and not being the most professional, as long as it isn't suggested that this is representative of all real-world psychologists and psychiatrists. And it isn't. In addition to some psychologists and therapists that we'll inherently dislike, there are at least a few who will respect and who seem like they really put their patients' needs first. In fact, I actually really enjoyed certain parts of the mental health discussion. Although this is kind of weird for a thriller-type novel, I actually found some of the conversations like between the narrator and his old therapist to be quite therapeutic and inspirational in and of themselves. Now, I'm in a pretty decent place right now in terms of my own mental health, but having been through some less extreme mental health challenges myself, including depression and anxiety, I don't think it's something I would necessarily have been able to appreciate quite as much, and as someone who's a chronic overthinker, I just don't think it would have been good for me at uh, a time when I was pretty deep in depressive thinking to read this book. Obviously, it's everyone's own judgment, you know yourself best, and it's going to depend on your own circumstances, but just take care of yourself if you're reading this book, and I encourage you to put it down and come back to it later if you find any of these discussions of mental health hitting a little too close to home for you. So in this book, we're trying to understand why a woman named Alicia murdered her husband for reasons that we simply don't understand, uh, as since at least based on our own knowledge at the start of the story, they had a pretty happy marriage. And beyond that, there's another puzzling aspect of the mystery, which is that she's not spoken since the incident, thus giving the book its name, The Silent Patient. She now resides in a mental ward for patients, uh, mostly criminals, I think, uh, deemed potentially dangerous to themselves and to others, where she sits in complete silence, although she's prone to the occasional outburst of violence when provoked. The narrator, Theo, is a therapist, and he's come to the mental ward specifically because he thinks he might be able to figure out what's vexing Alicia. Uh, 
we learn pretty quickly that he's kind of obsessed with Alicia's story to an extent that we can probably recognize as inappropriate, uh, leading us to begin questioning his own judgment both as a therapist and a narrator. And it's interesting because our detective, so to speak, is not really even a detective, but a therapist. We get the sense that it's not really supposed to be a detective story at all, but the narrator is turning it into one. We also kind of respect the narrator, at least in my case I did, because this interest in Alicia feels, at first, like a sort of very normal human empathy. This sort of desire to understand why someone is so utterly mentally troubled, even someone who committed a terrible crime, to feel sorry for her, whatever brought her to that breaking point. It's also not totally a secret that Theo is overstepping his bounds in his relationship with this particular patient. He himself acknowledges from the start that he's behaving inappropriately, and he's not even the only one guilty of this. Many of his other colleagues working at the Grove, as this um, psych ward is called, are also just a bit untrustworthy to us as readers because they all seem in a way to be more concerned with cracking this patient and getting her to open up. They're trying to egg her on instead of letting her communicate or even speak with her on her own terms when she feels like it. We get the sense that at least in certain moments they're more interested in cracking the mystery of what's wrong with her than in actually helping her to improve mentally. So we as readers sort of have the secondary question, which is what is going to become of this narrator by the end of the story? And this becomes more complicated as we learn that things are not going well at home. I also just found the first half of this book in particular to be an interesting exploration of the therapist-patient relationship in which Theo basically explains how he sees that it's supposed to work, his philosophy to therapy. I pretty much fundamentally agree with him too, although I don't totally know um, as not a therapist myself, but basically as he described it, when a patient comes to the therapist, the patient has a hard time processing their own feelings, uh, so the therapist kind of holds it and feels it for them. And it's interesting here because we see the narrator describe his relationship with his own therapist, and we understand how it looks when it's done right. But then we see him basically proceed to do it all wrong with his own patient in a clumsy way where he maybe kind of does it right for a little while, and then he gets impatient, and he starts being too forceful in a way that, though it's not like really abusive or anything, it seems pretty obviously wrong and unproductive to us as readers, which we know because he's already told us that it's the wrong way to do things. From a strictly therapy-focused perspective, I do think he placed a little bit too much stock in the idea that every difficult emotion you have pretty much stems from something in your relationship or your non-relationship with your parents. I mean, this may be true in some cases, but my impression is that this seems far from universal. And Theo and his patient Alicia are both sympathetic characters, and we may like them both in certain ways, despite that they both certainly have their problems they're dealing with. However, the other characters in the novel never seemed quite to reach the same level of personality and excitement, despite some of them playing an important role in the plot itself. That's about all I can say about this book without delving into the spoilers, though, so time to peace out if you're going to read this one yourself. Alright, spoilers beginning now. So I'll get right to it. This book ends with quite a twist. I didn't mention that in the spoiler-free section because, frankly, I think knowing that a book ends on a twist is often quite a spoiler in itself and reduces its overall impact, which was the case for this book for me since everyone who mentions this book praises it for its final twist. Now, I'll admit that being a mystery book, we probably should expect some sort of a twist, uh, as I do in any of Agatha Christie's works, for example, so I can't really gripe too much, as I still enjoyed seeing what happened. Now, is it a good twist? I thought it was. Uh, it wasn't the most mind-blowingly surprising twist in the world, and many readers who are well-versed in this sort of story may have guessed it right from the start. I myself didn't really figure it out pretty much until right when it was revealed, but one thing I enjoyed about this particular twist was the very fact that it didn't feel to me too contrived or totally out of left field. It felt like the clues were there and it was set up properly, so I should have probably figured it out, but you know, I didn't because I just wasn't paying keen enough attention, and I was misled, as I was supposed to be. I did, of course, notice by the halfway point or a bit later that the narrator's marital relationship paralleled Alicia's, but as the author probably intended, I thought that this was sort of an intentional literary parallel and ex intended to explain part of why the narrator feels so emotionally invested in this patient's outcome. The trick, of course, is that this is all a device the author is using when there are actually two different timelines, seven years apart, interwoven with each other and told as one narrative. I've seen mixed reviews on whether readers liked this. Some have said they found it gimmicky or that they figured it out too soon, but for me it worked, and upon reflection at the end, it didn't seem so forced as to make it seem completely unbelievable or manipulative to me, uh, particularly because it's being told by a character who is himself quite manipulative, so it makes sense that he's presenting the information to us unreliably and selectively. And most of us probably question the narrator's reliability at some point, but maybe just not 
so much uh, in, in this exact way. For me, there was another thing that kind of threw me off, which is that the narrator refers to his wife, Kathy, in both timelines uh, towards the beginning of the book, making us think that his marriage is disintegrating and it must all be happening at the same time. It turns out in the end that this it, that it isn't. His marriage actually survived despite the trouble that he went through uh, seven years ago. And this was the only part that felt to me a, a little bit convenient for supporting the illusion of everything happening at the same time. But, I mean, it, it, it worked fine. And, and this gets to part of the ending that was the most frustrating for me in, in a purely emotional sense. We see that seven years later, Theo's still with Kathy, his wife. So in a completely psychological sense, in trying to save Alicia from her cheating husband, he totally broke her and threw her off the deep end and ruined her marriage and her life. While in his own parallel situation, his marriage may not have thrived, but it was far from absolutely ruining his life situation, even if the whole murder thing uh, kind of turned him into a nut, obviously. Now, what about the whole overall mystery investigation? Uh, by the middle of the book, we have some conflicting stories about the characters, particularly Alicia. So if we weren't already questioning how honest they're all being to each other and even to us readers, well, we are at that point. Honestly, though, the Agatha Christie-esque elements of this book, including all these brief investigations of other people who may have had a motive in the murder, it wasn't one of the strongest parts of the novel for me. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was important investigating these leads, especially because they served to distract attention away from Theo's own involvement. But some of them fell a bit flat in that, aside from maybe some of the other therapists, none of the other relatives and characters outside of the hospital really reached the level of serious suspicion in my eyes. Maybe more importantly, though, I found these sections where Theo was investigating Gabriel's brother's connections, for, for instance, um, to be weaker because they distracted from the overall mentally hazy, gloomy atmosphere of the psych ward and almost even lightened things up a bit too much for me. I wish the author had instead just leaned a bit further into the character and development of some of the stronger characters like the doctors at the psych ward, uh, because the development of Theo and Alicia in particular is one way in which this novel stands out from its inspirations in Agatha Christie's works. There's also this emerging question throughout the novel as we learn more about what Alicia was going through, of should we trust Alicia? We're supposed to feel bad for her since no one's listening to her about the strange man she sees following her around, but it's also complicated because she did have a history of paranoia and mental health issues. Of course, to be totally fair to Alicia, that shouldn't absolve others from guilt. Like, they might doubt her with the reason, but they should absolutely be looking to take extra special care of her, and her husband clearly wasn't doing that. As for me, I wasn't really sure whether to believe her, but by the time we kept coming back to her story again and again, and no one was believing her, it just made sense at that point that she had to be telling the truth, if only because it seemed necessary for an interesting ending. I also have one sort of small literary gripe about the whole silent patient idea, which is that Alicia is not really a silent patient to us in the story. I mean, maybe I'm just nitpicking, but from the very start of the novel, we get glimpses into Alicia's diary that are often revealing more than what the narrator himself knows. Not only that, but they're showing Alicia's own impressions rather than forcing the narrator and the reader to make our own conclusions about what the silent Alicia was thinking. I feel like this just slightly undermines the premise of having a patient who we presume is so mentally traumatized or something that she cannot and will not speak, and it keeps Alicia from ever really being a truly silent patient. Now you could argue that the importance is not that Alicia is and always was silent, but that there's a before and an after, that there was something that happened to make her become silent, and we have to figure out what that is. But it's still a bit weird because the reader is placed at an advantage even over Theo right from the start. Like, we as readers might not know everything about Alicia, but we at least know something from her diary. Like I said, this was the way the author chose to do it, and it's a small gripe, but I'm curious how this book might have looked if Alicia was not immediately given her own voice in this way. So that's all I have to say on The Silent Patient. I enjoyed the book a lot, it was a pretty quick read, and it was something a little different than the other stuff I've been reading lately. Have you read this book or anything like it? What did you think? And remember, if you'd like to hear any more of these weekly reviews on this or a whole variety of other topics, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, bye and happy reading.